Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you may know, we are in a new quarter as we describe it. The studies we're going to make or have for the books of, for the months of April, May, and June of 2013. This particular series of lessons is on the Minor Prophets, and this is the second lesson on Hosea, the first of those 12 Minor Prophets. It's entitled, Love and Judgment, God's Dilemma. And you really need your Bible to, to, to follow. We, we're going to be looking at a number of verses in, in this lesson, doing a little bit of jumping around, so I hope you're nimble with your fingers. But before we actually jump into the Bible, let's have a word of prayer together, help us, ask the Lord to guide us in our study. Our kind and loving Father, it's hard for us to imagine how you could possibly deal with a group of people that we read about in the book of Hosea. The incredible things they did with all the background and, and so forth and everything you did to try to reach out to, to convince them and yet to see the demise of the northern kingdom and their scattering to the winds in the country of Assyria. Help us now to understand what you want us to, to know is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Last week we, we read the section in 2 Kings chapter 17 verses 5 to 23 that describes what was going on, the political background of what was going on in the days of Hosea. If you haven't had a chance to read that, you really need to do that in order to understand what we're going to talk about today. Along with that passage from 2 Kings 17, you need to look at Hosea chapter 4, verses 11 to 16. We're going to put with that a number of other passages in the Bible, from Judges 2 and 3 and Hosea 7 and 10 and Matthew 11 and Romans 5, 1 Peter 2 and Hosea 14. So you can see we're going to be jumping around a little bit. We're going to focus on what we are supposed to learn from all this incredible nonsense that was going on in the days of Hosea. In Hosea 1 to 3, we learned about the fact that Hosea was told by God to marry a prostitute. And then when she, they had a child together, and then she had two more children, apparently from other men, not from Hosea. Then she finally left Hosea completely and went back to her prostitution. And then, eventually, God said to Hosea, okay, go find her wherever she is doing her thing and get her back. Pay to bring her back. That's in chapter 3. Well, what's he trying to teach through this incredible story? He's trying to say, this basically is a parallel to what I, the, the relationship I have been forced into with my children of Israel. Well, you know, God had to pay to get us back. Jesus had to die. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you, you, as you told that story, if you just had in your mind God working with this rebellious people, mm -hmm. it's a tremendously patient, mm -hmm. loving, wooing relationship, even though mm -hmm. there's some descriptions of what's going to happen to them if they keep this up. There's still this this overarching uh, feeling of I want you, I need you, please come back. I I want yeah. to have a relationship with you. Well, God, if you, as you remember, took the children of Israel out of Egypt after they've been in slavery for about a hundred years, brought them into the land of Canaan after a delay of forty years in the wilderness, finally got them to settle down there. They were supposed to drive out all the enemies before them. They didn't. They were put in that place. So in basically the center of the, of the then known civilized world, everybody had to travel, if, unless they went across the, across the Mediterranean Sea by boat, they had to travel down through that area if they wanted to go from Egypt, the, the powerhouse and the, and the fruit basket, the food basket of the south, over to the Mesop Mesopotamian Crescent, Iran and Iraq, where those were the two major powers, and there was Israel right between them, and, and in the north there was, of course, Assyria. 
And so both Assyria and Egypt are at this point in, in Hosea's story are vying to be the next rising power in, in, in the history of the world. And where, what's between them, the two of them? This. The land of Palestine, the children of Israel. And they were basically just at the end of guns on both ends. That same relationship with the other nations is what in apostolic times they could upset the world, turn it upside down in, in such a, uh, because there's so much cross traffic there. Well, and so we see that in the Bible, God tries to help the children of Israel, both from the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, to understand how he feels about them. He pictures himself as a husband with this prostitute wife. He pictures himself as a parent with a rebellious child. What else is he supposed to do? How do you deal with rebellious, obstinate, disobedient children? I, one of my first patients today in the clinic was a young um, Arab woman, and she's having a terrible time with her, her son. She's a very petite woman, short, and now the son, even though he's very young, is already taller than she is. And he looks down on her and basically she says, he doesn't care what she says to him. It makes no difference to him whatsoever. What's amazing is, okay, this is the God that was a pillar of fire by night mm -hmm. and a cloud during the day, took the, the children out of uh, bondage mm -hmm. and brought them and, and now settled them down in this land. How come they don't like God? What, why don't they, why do they fall out of love with God? Yeah. Well, Wait. fertility cult religion is more fun. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> it, isn't the modern day word for that syncretism? They yeah. just wanted to be part of, of, of what's around them. They, want to, they don't want to be different. They don't want to be, uh, they just want to well, be part of the crew. Well, you know, if they look down the road, what they're doing has no place to lead but disease and death. And God's way, to me, it leads to a very nice, fulfilling life. Uh, they just didn't seem to choose that. They didn't want to choose that. They always chose this way. They did a study when they asked men, young men, would they like, if they knew they would die five years, if they took uh, to get muscles and do certain things and live really well and have all the women they can get for five years and die. And many, many of them said they'd just do it. It's pathetic, but... Immediate gratification. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the Bible, we read from, starting from Deuteronomy 8, ver uh, uh, verse 5, and let's just read that. God talks about how if you are a loving parent, you have to discipline your children. Yes. And I quote, Remember that the Lord your God corrects and punishes you just as a father disciplines his children. And this, this message goes all through the Bible. Let me choose a verse way over at the end. Um, well, let's, Hebrews 12, verse 6, for example. Because the Lord corrects everyone he loves and punishes everyone he accepts as his child. What does a good parent do? He tries to discipline, he tries to correct, he tries to guide his children. So what is God supposed to do if the discipline isn't working? How does God discipline us? Well, these are the things we talk about in the book of Hosea. Look at these, look at these words about how God tried to deal with them. I, this is God speaking to the children of Israel. I bent down to them and fed them. They refused to return to me, and so they must return to Egypt, and Assyria will rule them. Remember we said Assyria was to the north and Egypt was to the south. War will sweep through their cities and break down the city gates. It will destroy my people because they do what they themselves think best. They insist on turning away from me. They will cry out because of the yoke that is on them, but no one will lift it from them. And then God's cry, how can I give you up, Israel? How can I abandon you? Could I ever destroy you as I did Adma or treat you as I did Zeboim? My heart will not let me do it. 
My love for you is too strong. I will not punish you in my anger. I will not destroy Israel again, for I am God and not a human being. I, the Holy One, am with you. I will not come to you in anger. So when things were good with them, God is such a nice person that um, they forgot that it was God who was blessing them and giving them all these things, and they just took God for granted. And they thought everything they had was because they had done it, and they didn't realize God was blessing their fig trees and making their crops go. And, mm -hmm. and But that it, runs out, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, they can continue that and, and run off while, while God's holding his arms out, pleading with them to come back, they don't want to, and they just continue going. Until the figs run out. And he lets them go until the figs run out. What do, what do we know about those two cities that are mentioned, Adma and Zeboim? They're around. Aren't they near Sodom but and Gomorrah? In the days of Abraham and Lot, there were five cities in the Jordan Valley, southeast of the Dead Sea. You can read about it in Genesis 14, verse 8. Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Zoar. Only Zoar survived the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah. And why did Zoar survive? Because when, when Lot was running, he said, God, please let me go to this little village over here. It's not a bad place. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just move in there for a while. Please let, let me have that city. And God says, well, okay, I guess it's not too big a place. I'll preserve that one. That's the only reason any of those cities survived. And it wasn't long before, if, if we believe the writings of Ellen White, he, he realized how wicked things were in Zoar. He says, you know, God's going to zap this city pretty soon. I better get out of here. And he ended up living in the mountains. Well, what are we supposed to learn from all of that? The Christian church has traditionally taught that God hates sin and is very angry at sin and sinners. We know this. This idea is, contra and you know, what's, what's he going to do with the sinners who don't, miss, who don't behave and don't come back? Throw them in eternal, eternally burning hell. This idea, is contradict, this idea is contradicted by verses like Romans 5, verse 8. Let me just look at that. But God has shown us how much he loves us. It was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. Does that sound like God is terribly angry and ready to zap sinners? Look at 1 Peter 2, 24. Christ himself carried our sins in his body to the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. And there's a lot of other verses. And live for righteousness means and live. Do what, doing what is right. To live, to do right. If Jesus died, as the church has taught for, many, for millennia, experiencing the wrath of God against sin, the same death that sinners will experience in the end, that's what we say, how was God involved in that death? In Christ's death? Mm -hmm. Well, um, Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mm -hmm. So, is that, that a clue? Us, does that give us a clue? Through, through Jesus' own words, it yeah. sounds like God forsook Jesus. Down through the ages, the Christian church has repeatedly tried to threaten people with the wrath of God even the threat of an eternally burning hell, to get them to do what the church wanted them to do, often to give more money, for example. So if you hold this big club up and you say, if you don't do what I want you to do, I'm going to zap you, I'm going to have God zap you, how are people supposed to respond? And what do they think of the God that they think is portrayed? They I believe that, is portrayed. I think there's a fair number of people who don't even think about that. They, they, they've heard, they heard the fear thing. They find, they find that all they got to do is pay their fire insurance premium, <laughs> which is the offering, and that's it. They don't think about the ramifications of wh what this God really is and if they're going to live with him. It, it's, mm -hmm. I had that experience with a fellow today, and, and uh, here you go through logically what you, uh, you, I think is logical. Get to that point, and, well, I'd just be glad to be there. And I'm not going to worry about that. And it's just, <laughs> but some people have turned God himself into a... Uh, Whore. Yeah. Yeah, you scratch oh, yeah. good and it'll give you what you want. Yeah. Well, that's a pagan idea, you mm -hmm. know. You, you, you put your money in and the, ch and the chicken uh, does its mm -hmm. dance. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the lazy man's idea. 
he doesn't really want anything no. to do with God, but he knows, he just thinks if I pay, mm -hmm. I'll get my ticket to mm -hmm. heaven, mm -hmm. but don't bother me with uh, any I'm learning. I just think it's hard work. Right? Where God says, come let us reason together. Mm -hmm. God, wants, God wants us to think. So what is the truth about how God finally irrevocably pours out his wrath on those who are determined to rebel against him? Do we understand clearly what God's wrath is? What does God do when he pours out his wrath and anger? Now, we're, we're, we're moving away from Hosea briefly, but we're going to come back and, and learn the, the message of Hosea. I mean, what does God do? What about our famous verse that we believe we're supposed to be preaching to the world, right? A third angel followed the first two, saying in a loud voice, whoever worships the beast in its image and receives a mark on their forehead or on their hand will themselves drink God's wine, the wine of his fury, which he has poured at full strength into the cup of his anger. All who do this will be tormented in fire and sulfur before the holy angels of the Lamb. The smoke of the fire that torments them goes up forever and ever. There is no relief day or night for those who worship the beast in its image for anyone who has the mark of its name. Didn't so, Jesus, does that sound exciting? Didn't this is Jesus, the last stand. Didn't Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane drink that cup? Is that the same kind of cup that was mentioning in that verse? And Jesus says, please let this cup pass from me. Um, and there's a cup in yeah. there also. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's talking about, well, let's, let's talk about what it does mean I, before okay. I just spill the beans here. Oh. Where would you look in the Bible to get a clear definition of God's wrath? Romans 1, 18, 24, 26, and 28. Okay, but we don't have to stick with the New Testament. Let's go to the Old Testament Hosea first. 11, 8. There's some incredible verses. Um, well, let's just do the Romans 1 since you mentioned that. Let's do that one first. Romans 1, 18. God's anger is revealed from heaven against all the sin and evil of the people whose evil ways prevent the truth from being known. So the first two words... God's anger. Mm -hmm. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. Okay. The interesting thing is that that comes right after it talks about in verse 16, the I gospel. have complete confidence in the gospel, the good news. What does God's anger have to do with the good news? Hmm. Keep reading. <laughs> well, if, you, if you're reading in Greek, it's very clear. Modern versions, it, it, this sentence goes on and on and on and on and on. They thought that was fine in Greek. We have a problem with that in English. The, the, the sentence is punctuated when you get down to verses 24 and 26 and 28. So God has given those people over to do the filthy things their hearts desire. Does that sound like what was going on in Hosea's day? Verse 26, because they do this, God has given them over to shameful passions. Verse 28. Now, this is in the same chapter that starts out about God's anger. Right. You're reading same, down farther a little. It's the end of that same sentence. Okay. Because those people refuse to keep in mind the true knowledge about God. The true knowledge about God. Is that a clue? He lets them go. He has given them over to corrupted minds so that they do the things they should not do. And you put her, uh, Romans 4.25 in there. And then, the father did that with his son, treated Jesus. So we, yeah, mm -hmm. we, we look here and we say, well, what's happening here? The word that's used here to describe God's, what God does when he's angry is paradidomy. He hands them over. Well, look at Romans is 4. Is that like a parent just tries and tries and tries with their child and says, I can't do anything more. Mm -hmm. You're on your own. Mm -hmm. Well, look and a parent does not do that with a, any hate in their heart. They do it with the most sadness in their heart. Mm -hmm. Well, look at Romans 4.25 and see how this carries on with the theme. Because of our sins, he, is talking about Christ, was handed over to die. And he was raised to life in order to put us right with God. Now that, now, that makes you think, why have you forsaken me? Mm-hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Or have you let me go? 
Why have you handed and me why, over to why die? Why are you mentioning that? What did Christ say? Well, handed over. You know, in the in the Greek, it's, there's nothing about handed over to die. The to no, die is not, not in there. there. It just says, because of our sins, he was handed over. Paradid, when he, when he left the same heaven. words. Before he created anybody, they planned this out, and he left heaven. That's when God let him go. Mm -hmm. Now, why were the words to die put in there? No, Jesus was handed over. Well, because because that's what we know. That's what that's what happened. We all know that's what happened. Well, look at the parallel in Matthew twenty seven, forty six. What did Jesus say when he was handed over? At about three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud shout, Eli, Eli, Lema Sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why did you abandon me? Why did you hand me over? Yeah. Why did you let me go? Right? Now, where's the fire? Yeah. How about that? Is that where we get the term God forsaken? You say yeah. something is God forsaken. Mm -hmm. That means that God has left it. Yeah, I, I think so. At least uh, sometimes. <laughs> we know back from Genesis 2.17 that Adam and Eve were told not to sin or you, or you will die. Romans 6.23 says very plainly, and I quote, For sin pays its wage death, but God's free gift is eternal life in union with Christ Jesus our Lord. So it's pretty clear. And Isaiah, if we go back to Isaiah 59, verse 2, it says, It is because of your sins that he doesn't hear you. It is your sins that separate you from God when you try to worship him. What was separating Christ, or Jesus, on the cross from his Father? You could say our sins. He was treated as we, we should, as we deserve, mm -hmm. that he can treat us as he deserves. Yeah, because so he if was we sinless. get if we get separated from the source of life, what happens to us? You die, yeah. like a coal that gets separated from the rest of the fire, mm -hmm. goes out and dies. Mm -hmm. Like a balloon that goes <laughs> and just disappears. <laughs> okay, understanding God's anger or wrath and how it is very different than human anger or wrath is one of the major lessons we need to learn from Scripture. The key is to understand what God does when he pours out his wrath. And that's, of course, the understanding to Revelation, the third angel's message, basically. What do the following passages teach us about God's anger and its results? Let's look at some of these passages. You know, some people say, well, you just picked a couple of verses you like in the New Testament, you twisted them to make your point. I beg to differ. Look at this. Here, let's start off with Deuteronomy. Is that far enough in the Old Testament for you? Mm-hmm. Okay, Deuteronomy 31, verses 16 to 18. The Lord said to Moses, You will soon die, and after your death the people will become unfaithful to me and break the covenant that I made with them. They will abandon me and worship the pagan gods of the land they are about to enter. Does that sound like the Hosea story? Yes. yes. When that happens, I will become angry with them. I will throw them into eternally burning hell, I will torture them, I will beat up on them. No, I will abandon them and they will be destroyed. Many terrible diseases will come upon them and then they will realize that these things are happening to them because I, their God, am no longer with them. And I will refuse to help them then because they have, gone, they have done evil and worshipped other gods. Is that a clue? What happens when God's anger is displayed, when he becomes angry? I'm using the biblical term now for anger. Hand them over. Yeah. And many disasters will come upon them because the Lord's hand will not be there to prevent those disasters. Look at Deuteronomy 31, verse 17. I will become angry with them. I will abandon them. I will turn away from them. That's God's word translation. What about a Hebrew translation, the Tanakh? My anger will flare up against them, and I will abandon them and hide my countenance from them. So really, what we should be doing is running towards God and saying, don't abandon me, please be with me. God, be with me, be with me, be with me, and never abandon me. That's David's prayer. Mm -hmm. Create in me a clean heart. 
Be with me. Don't be with me. Come, give me a heart of flesh. Yeah. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Yeah. Well, look at Numbers 32. We're going to go back even further in the Old Testament. Verses 13 to 15. The Lord was angry with the people and made them wander in the wilderness for 40 years until that whole generation that had displeased him was dead. What happens when you're separated from God, when you make him angry? And now you have taken your father's place, a new generation of sinful men ready to bring down the fierce anger of the Lord on Israel again. If you people of Reuben and Gad refuse to follow him now, he will once again abandon all these people in the wilderness and you will be responsible for their destruction. God was angry. He does what? Abandons. He abandons us. Deuteronomy 29. Now you might say, well, but I'm, I'm not involved in that. I don't see him turning his back and, and trudging and running off in another direction. No. But he just hands them over. He, he lets, them, he go lets the, them go the way they want to go. Headed. Yeah, exactly where they're headed. Look at Deuteronomy 29, 19. Make sure that there is no one here today. This is, of course, Moses speaking to the children of Israel who hears these solemn demands and yet convinces himself that all will be well with him even if he stubbornly goes his own way. See, I can run away from God. Nothing's going to happen to me. That would destroy all of you, good and evil alike. That was Deuteronomy 29, 19. So God's way is life. Mm-hmm. But well, we know what happened in the book of Joshua. What happened in the book of Joshua? Moses is gone. Joshua takes him into the land of Canaan. They fight a number of battles. They're, Joshua, every time they, they're fought, they fight a battle under Joshua, and they, sometimes God even delays the going down of the sun so they can be successful. And what happens? He throws his hail down, and so more people are killed by the hail that God throws down than by the spears of the Israelites. And this, is all, this goes on for a period of time. And Joshua gets to be an old man, and he's tired. Did they thank God for protecting them and, and taking care of their enemies? Or did they think I they did it? So. A, okay. We don't have a record of that. Okay. But what unfortunately happens is as soon as Joshua said, well, go ahead, do your thing. I've divided up the land. Here's your piece. Clean it out. Get rid of all these people here. And they went in, and they settled down, and they left their enemies right there among them. And what was the result? Just what we had in Hosea. The result is Hosea. Why do God's people always take up the traits of people who are not God's people? How come God's people can't make those people come into God's way? Why doesn't the good pull the evil up instead of the evil pulling the good down? Yeah, the evil seems to always pull the good down. Like and maybe we, ought to le maybe we ought to learn that <laughs> lesson. Yeah, they it's work harder at it. That's a disease, and those are the symptoms. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you see us in that situation, this, the disease will produce the same symptom. Yeah. Well, Only the creator that can bring back to health. Look at, go to Judges 2 and see what happens. There's an incredible story here. Joshua sent the people, this I'm reading from Judges 2 starting with verse 6. Joshua sent the people of Israel on their way and each man went to take possession of his own share of the land. As long as Joshua lived, the people of Israel served the Lord. After his death, they continued to do so as long as the leaders were alive who had seen for themselves all the great things that the Lord had done for Israel. So Joshua's alive, things are going well. Even the people who lived beyond Joshua, who, who were associates with Joshua, so long as they were alive, things were doing pretty well. But they couldn't pass that experience on. The Lord's servant Joshua, son of Nun, died at the age of 110. He was buried in his own part of the land at Timnasareth in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gaash. That whole generation also died, and the next generation forgot the Lord and what he had done for Israel. Can you imagine that? I mean, bringing them out of Egypt, 40 years in the wilderness, taking them into the land of Canaan, winning battles for them, knocking down the walls of Jericho, and on and on and on and on, all those things that happened to them. And one generation, they forgot him? 
Well, you know, and but this generation even was living with the fruits and the land and everything around them, and they didn't, um, they took it for granted. Well, notice what happens. Then the people of Israel sinned against the Lord and began to serve the Baals. When is this? Is this in, 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 in Hosea's day? Oh. Is this in Solomon's day? Oh, way before that. Way that? before that. They're barely out of Egypt. They stopped worshiping the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God who brought them out of Egypt, and they began to worship other gods, the gods of the peoples <laughs> around them. Well, they had that mixed multitude that came out with them. Yeah. Well, and they didn't even need them. They, they moved well, in among... But they, yeah. they, I think that's... A yeah, lot that, of it starts there. Yeah. It was and, only and a, they willingly go trudging along. It was only 110 years past when they had come into the Promised Land. Past so what? I mean, from the time they... I mean, when this is talking about? Yes. Oh, less than that. Less than that. Yeah. Because Joshua was already fairly old by okay. the time he, he died at 110. So not very many years. No. And, um, so they bowed down to these other gods and made the Lord angry. Now we're talking about God's anger. So now God's angry. What does he do? They stopped worshiping the Lord and served the Baals and the Astartes. The Baals and the Astartes, who are they? The male fertility cult gods, the female fertility cult gods. And so the Lord became furious with Israel and let raiders attack and rob them. He let enemies all around overpower them, and the Israelites could no longer protect themselves. Every time they went into battle, the Lord was against them, just as he had said he would be. They were in great distress. So what is God doing? He's saying, he's okay. Testing, he's testing Israel, verse 22. And then the Lord, God, uh, Lord gave the Israelites leaders who saved them from the raiders. But the Israelites paid no attention to their leaders. Israel was unfaithful to the Lord and worshipped other gods. Their fathers had obeyed the Lord's commands, but this new generation soon stopped doing so. Whenever the Lord gave Israel a leader, the Lord would help that leader and would save the people from their enemies as long as that leader lived. The Lord would have mercy on them because they groaned under their suffering and oppression. But when the leader died... So God was giving good leaders. He was giving good leaders in the people did not want to follow that leader. Were these leaders prophets or were they just Some, leaders? A few. Some of them were prophets. Samuel was the classic example of the prophet. Well then, when they would serve and worship other gods and refuse to give up their own evil ways, then the Lord would become furious with Israel and say, this nation has broken the covenant that I have commanded their ancestors to keep because they have not obeyed me. I will no longer drive out any of the nations that were still in the land when Joshua died. I will use them to find out whether or not these Israelites will follow my ways as their ancestors did. So the Lord allowed those nations to remain in the land. He did not give Joshua victory over them, nor did he drive them out soon after Joshua's death. And it goes on in chapter 3 again and again and again. I mean, the same message. I mean, I don't know, I don't know how many times. What are we learning about well, let's take one. Judges 3, 7 and 9. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, forgetting the Lord their God. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of Christian Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. What's happening? They turn from God. God gets angry. He, he, he lets them go. He lets them go. They be punished. Then they, they, they say, we're in trouble. They come back. And he sends them another prophet. Mm -hmm. I, I saw this archaeology uh, program on TV, and they were doing a dig, and the man said, we think this was a Jewish settlement, but I don't think it was a Jewish settlement because it's got all these pagan little statues and gods. And I thought, yeah, that was a Jewish settlement. <laughs> <laughs> it's with judges. Yeah. <laughs> well... It should be very clear from all these passages. Well, let me read one more. Judges 10, 6 to 12. I'm just picking a few key phrases. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hand of the Ammonites, another nation. It should be very clear from all of these passages that God's anger is not like our anger. The Bible repeatedly describes God's anger as his turning away in loving disappointment 
from those who don't want him anyway, thus leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. Now, if we are to look at that story mm -hmm. as a model for end time events, mm -hmm. we can expect God to say, okay, it's over. I'm going to let you, mm -hmm. I'm going to just let you do as you please. The world doesn't want me, so. My church doesn't even want me. Mm -hmm. And, 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 but this time, there's no cycling this time. This time, it's the end. Mm -hmm. And there's, well, the, there, there's no second coming back. We, yeah. We've got to get serious with this. Yeah. And, of course, a lot of people will say, well, God gets angry and he's going to demand his pound of flesh. And boy, he's a sovereign God and he's got his big stick and he's going to do his thing. But Hosea, and that's what we're focusing on here. Hosea tells us in the clearest words he possibly can how God feels about all this. We, we turn back to Hosea 11. Let me look at these few verses but, once again. Yeah. You know, God said, uh, we think God is like our judicial system and a judge. We think it's like a prison or something. But doesn't God say, my ways are not your ways? Mm -hmm. Right. We can't plug God into our system. Yeah. Well, the Lord says, Hosea 11, starting with verse 1, When Israel was a child, I loved him and called him out of Egypt as my son. So we mentioned earlier that God uses parallel things to what we know. Here's a parent with a child, right? But the more I called to him, the more he turned away from me. My people sacrificed to Baal. They burned incense to idols. Yet, it was I, yet I was the one who taught Israel to walk. I took my people up in my arms, but they did not acknowledge that I took care of them. I drew them to me with affection and love. I picked them up and held them to my cheek. I bent down to them and fed them. And what's their response? They refused to return to me, and so they must return to Egypt, and Assyria will rule over them. Now, here we have the nation in the south, the nation in the north, and they're fighting over this territory between them. War will sweep through their cities and break down the city gates. It will destroy my people because they do what they themselves think best. Now, Peterson puts that as, my people are hell-bent on leaving me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Notice that this is not just doing whatever they feel like. Well, I guess it is in a sense, but it's, these people are not just being enticed into sin. Kind of, they're literally doing what they think is right. In the Say Bible. that again with an exclamation point. <laughs> yeah. They think they're doing what is right. Well, you know. Ergo, yeah. the people in the last days mm -hmm. will be doing what they think is right. Yeah. The whole world wondered or worshipped the beast. Well, Revelation and, 13. And doesn't God say, I always thought that this is a scary <laughs> passage, when they choose to believe a lie, in other words, they don't want to believe the Bible, Mm -hmm. I give them up to strong delusions, or I send them strong. In other words, if you want to believe a lie, God lets your mind be very solid in that lie. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of scary. That's hardening your heart. Hardening Reading your heart. on, verse 7 of Hosea 11, they insist on turning away from me. What can God do? They insist on turning away from me. They're adults. They will, huh? They're adults. What yeah. can a parent do with the kids? They will cry out because of the yoke that is on them, but no one will lift it from them. And then God cries out, How can I give you up, Israel? How can I abandon you? Could I ever destroy you as I did Adma, or teach you as I did Zeboim? My heart will not let me do it. My love for you is too strong. I will not punish you in my anger. I will not destroy Israel again. For I am God and not a human being, I the Holy One, and with you I will not come to you in anger. You know, in the Garden of Eden, original sin, when Adam and Eve sinned, did this do something so that they no longer wanted to live God's way? They no longer wanted to like God. They started running from God. Mm -hmm. And does sin do something to us? And God knows that 
we don't like him because we have this sin growing in us. Mm -hmm. And he and salvation means um, salve. He yeah. wants to put healing salve he on us, heal us. Yeah. from the sin. The same word for salvation in the New Testament is, a, is the word for healing. That's what God wants to do. He wants to heal us. With a healing salve mm -hmm. over our festering sin. So what have we seen now? We have seen right through the Old Testament that when God demonstrates his anger, he, he, he lets people go. He lets them do what they want to do. We've turned to the New Testament, Romans 1, Romans 4, Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 27, 46. We have seen demonstrated in the, in the death of Christ what God does when he becomes angry. Does that fit with your definition of anger in the book of, in, in, in Webster's Dictionary? No. Not human when anger. We, when we read the Bible, do we need to take biblical definitions for our words, or do we need to go to Webster's to get the definitions of our words? It's safer to go to the Bible to get our definitions that the Bible uses. Let the exactly. Bible explain itself. Yeah, exactly. The Bi we need to let the Bible explain itself. So here we have God saying, when I am angry, I'm angry because, and why is God angry, by the way? Because he knows he's going to lose you. He knows he's going to lose us. He sees us. I mean, it's like you, you, you watch your, your kid destroying themselves. And what do you do? You can jump up and wave your arms and, and so forth and, and, and do whatever. But if the kid is determined to go his own way, you know, finally, you, you say, I'm sorry. You've chosen this for yourself. So where does the traditional view of God's wrath come from? I'm going to send fire, I'm going to burn you forever, or at least as long as you deserve. Mm -hmm. Where does that come from? Well, there that's are, not the biblical definition. Yeah. There are passages in the Bible, and interestingly <clears> enough, <throat> one of the most threatening is the third angel's message that we claim is our message that talk about eternally burning fire. So we have to go back and we have to look at the biblical definitions not only for God's wrath, we have to look at the biblical definition for fire, which turns out is a word to describe God's presence, His glory. We have to look at the biblical definition for forever. How long are these people burning if they're burning, etc. And then we have to go back and see what's burning in Isaiah 66, 24, and we discover the only thing that burns up at the end is dead, dead corpses. Dead corpses. Sinners who are already dead. There's no torture. There's no none of that. But the church, down through the ages, has done what? We want to force people to do what we tell them to do, so therefore we're going to threaten them with everything we can possibly think of to threaten them with. And that's what happened. So again we go reach for human definitions and human ways than for the Bible definition and Bible ways. A lot of people think that if God just gives us up, that can't be too serious. Well, Jesus was given up in Gethsemane and on Calvary. He died. Is, did he think it was serious? He was sweating blood. Yeah. When Jesus was given up by the Father, it was the most incredible thing that ever happened to them. Jesus died a human death, and, and not just a human death, a, 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 an um, incredibly horrible kind of death. It is what the Bible describes as the death of sinners, Isaiah 53, 4-9. Let's just look at that, because <clears throat> often those verses are misunderstood. Isaiah 53. But he, en he endured the suffering that should have been ours. So how do we understand that? <coughs> Excuse me. He endured the suffering that should have been ours. He took our place, right? The pain that we should have borne. All the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God. We did what? We thought his punishment... I'm sorry, his suffering was punishment sent by God. Was that a correct understanding, or according to the way that's worded, or, or a mistaken understanding? It's a mistaken. 
It's a mistaken understanding. Yeah, nothing to be punished for. Despised and rejected of men. They thought, mm -hmm. well, he's not well off financially. Look what's happening mm -hmm. to him. He must be a sinner because only sinners are going to get treated this way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But because of our sins, verse 5, he was wounded, be beaten because of the evil we did. We are healed by the punishment he suffered, made whole by the blows he received. All of us were like sheep that were lost, each of us going his own way. Notice, going his own way. We were left, we're leaving God, going our own way. But the Lord made the punishment fall on him, the punishment all of us deserved. And you go back to that uh, phrase, we thought. You know, sometimes when we read, I, I've noticed this with uh, students at school, you read what you think you know it's going to say. Mm -hmm. So that we could say all the while his suffering was punishment sent by God. And we could completely wipe out in our mind the words, we thought that. And then we're getting all the while his suffering was punishment sent by God. And we say, oh my gosh, it, that punishment was sent by God. And that's when we have a uh, preconception and we don't actually read what's on the page. Yeah. And that's, that's why... the only place that happens. That happens in a number of places. We well. leave out words. Mm -hmm. A classic example is John 16, 25, 26, and 27, where Jesus says, I will not. Speak to the Father on your behalf because the Father himself loves you. Oh, no, we know that Jesus is up there pleading with the Father. He has to be. I mean, we couldn't possibly survive in the presence of this holy God, this sovereign God, without Jesus pleading. Well, so earlier what, on, he what said, word I will do, pray. What word do we leave out then? Not. 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 We I, leave out, I mean, it's just the opposite. We make it into just the opposite of what it says. My father was an Adventist minister, pastor, so on. And I came down here and became acquainted with this particular concept. And uh, so one day I asked him to read John 16. And he just read right through and left out the knot. I said, try it again, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> he read it, left out the knot. And after about four or five attempts like that, I said, well, let me read it for you and you see if I miss something. So I read it with the knot in, and you should, I, I, can, well, I can't f ever forget the expression on his face yeah. when it finally came, when it dawned on him what it actually said. Yeah. Well, well, kids it, do it, that in school all the time. They read what they think instead of what's on the page. Did your dad warm to that concept? He, in a way, yes. Uh, he did. And he was, he was grateful for it, but I don't know that he ever really, really uh, fully incorporated, fully incorporated but I, I, it. I contrast that with a statement I'd heard years ago. Is one of the pastors says, if Jesus is not praying with the Father for you, damnable heresy, all, we're all lost. Something, some, yeah. I'm paraphrasing something there that yeah. is just... Uh, <laughs> well, he was arrested, and going back to Isaiah 53, he was arrested and sentenced and led off to die, and no one cared about his fate. He was put to death for the sins of our people. He was placed in a grave with the wicked. He was buried with the rich, even though he had never committed a crime or ever told a lie. He well, healed people and fed them, and we had to kill them. <laughs> and look at 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Christ was without sin, but for our sake God made him share our sin in order that in union with him we might share the righteousness of God. Now, in union with Christ, mm -hmm. can you go back to that one? Yeah, sorry. Because I have a short memory these days. Okay, in union with Christ, we might share the good doings of God. In other words, we are going to be people who, who do good in the world just like God does. Yeah, exactly. But the, I think the doings of God, it is God doing those things through, through us. us. We, so, don't have to, we don't have anything good to offer. We, need, we have to allow it. That's right. We, we, we need to now draw some conclusions. And we're going to take a little bit extra time here at the end. Let's see if we can, we can draw these conclusions together. Is it true that God does not torture or persecute the wicked in the end? He simply leaves them to reap the consequences of their own sins? Yes. Yes. Galatians 6, 7. What does it say in Galatians 6, 7? 
Do not deceive yourselves. No one makes a fool of God. People will reap exactly what they sow. Well, just like Adam and Eve, they reaped what they sowed and they ended up outside the Garden of Eden. Yeah. But God is always there wanting to uh, have us turn around so we can come back to Him. God never gives up on His children until there's literally nothing more that He can do for them. Even at that point, as demonstrated here in Hosea 11, He weeps over them as they leave Him. Will God, inside the city of the New Jerusalem, as it's down settling onto the surface of this earth, as he watches the wicked perish outside the city, will he be saying, ah, finally, or will he be weeping and crying? Uh, he'll be weeping and crying, and I believe we will be too. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely essential to understand God's wrath in scriptural terms and not in modern human terms. Once we have clearly understand this truth, understood this truth about God, we need to turn, for example, to the three angels' messages especially the third angel's message, and apply it to our understanding of that passage. Some of the Adventists have claimed that our message for the world is the three angels' messages. Are we teaching this truth about God's wrath as it is poured out on the wicked at the end? The very important and essential element that we learn from the book of Hosea, especially Hosea 11, needs to be emphasized. How will God feel as he must allow the wicked in the end to reap the very natural consequences of their rebellious choice, choices? He weeps. Well, He Hose must have wept, too, as Adam and Eve chose Satan over him, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. So, in conclusion, let's look. Review once again the miserable spiritual situation of God's people. Read especially 2 Kings 17, 5-23 and Hosea 4. You can go on to Hosea 6 and 7 and 8 and 9 and 10 and 12. The, the, the condition is just multiplied. If you can't remember those texts, go to the website, get the handout, and they'll be there so you can yeah. check, yeah. check it out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, what would you have done with such a group of people? What would we do? Well, what Hosea teaches us in the midst of this rebellion and rejection of God, he remained faithful to anyone who would return to him. But the mass of the people were running away as fast as they could go. God weeps over them and cries as they leave. And that's Hosea 6, 1 to 3, Hosea 11, 1 to 9, we read a few moments ago, Hosea 13, 4, 5, and 14, Hosea 14, 4, and 5, and it just, you know, it's on and on and on. And Hosea we, we can only be healed if we run towards God and not away from God. Well, and interestingly enough, what does Romans 14, 23 says? It says that anything that is not of faith is sin. Faith is what draws us closer to God, and sin is what takes us away from God. Romans 6, 23, we've already mentioned, sin pays its wage, and what's the wage? Death. Death. So either faith is going to draw us with God for eternity, or faith or sin is going to uh, us destruct us for eternity. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Through all of this, God repeatedly called for them to come back to Him and abandon their wickedness. Now, we haven't read again Second Kings 17. We read it last week. Look at it if you want to yourself. We don't have time to read it again. That incredible list of evil things they were doing. How could God even think of reaching out with love to people who were doing all those things? And yet he did. And look at some of the verses where he, where he does that. Look at chapter 5, verse 15. I will abandon my people until they have suffered enough for their sins and come, look, come looking for me. Perhaps in their suffering, they will try to find me. All of his reaching out does not guarantee anything. There is a decision that we have to make to go back to him before you can do anything. Look at chapter 6. The people say, let's return to the Lord. He has hurt us, but he will be sure to heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage our wounds, our wounds won't he? 
In two or three days he will revive us and we will live in his presence. I mean, there must have been at least a few people along with Hosea that were giving this kind of message. Right. Let us try to know the Lord. He will come to us as surely as the day dawns, as surely as the spring rains that water the earth. But the Lord says, Israel and Judah, what, I'm going to do, what am I going to do with you? Your love for me disappears as quickly as the morning mist. It is like dew that vanishes early in the day. That is why I have sent my prophets to you with my message of judgment and destruction. What I want from you is plain and clear. We looked at this earlier. I want you to your constant love, not your animal sacrifices. I would rather have my people know me than burn offerings to me. So what is the conclusion of all of this? God wants us to know him. Mm -hmm. Look at chapter 14. Here's the sort of conclusion. Return to the Lord your God, people of Israel. Your sin has made you stumble and fall. Return to the Lord and let this prayer be for your offering to him. God even gives them a prayer to pray. Forgive all our sins and accept our prayer and we will praise you as we have promised. Assyria can never save us and war horses cannot protect us. We will never again say to our idols that they are our God. O oh Lord, you show mercy to those who have no one else to turn to. Maybe we should put that prayer on our mirror in the morning and read yeah. it every morning. The Lord says, I will bring my people back to me. I will love them with all my heart. No longer am I angry with them. I will be to the people of Israel like rain in a dry land. They will blossom like flowers. They will, firm, they will be firmly rooted like the trees of Lebanon. They will be alive with new growth and beautiful like olive trees. They will be fragrant like the cedars of Lebanon. Once again, they will live under my protection. They will grow corn and be fruitful like a vineyard. They will be as famous as the wine of Lebanon. The people of Israel will have nothing more to do with idols. I will answer their prayers and take care of them. Like an evergreen tree, I will shelter them. I am the source of all their blessings. And he concludes, may those who are wise, who are the, who, who, who's he talking to here? Those who are wise. What are the wise people? The wise people are the ones who learn from their mistakes, right? May those who are wise understand what is written here and may they take it to heart. The Lord's ways are, are right and righteous people live by following them. But sinners stumble and fall because they ignore them. The children of Israel loved God's blessings and the privileges offered them, but they totally abandoned any concern for the responsibilities with those privileges. Could we do the same? Are we really telling the world the truth about God's wrath, anger, and fury? Think about it.